enter Robert Ripley's archives. Let's go to the show. Robin Ripley, leave it on us. <laughs> leave it on us. The year is 1963. Igor Benson's amazing new invention combines his aeronautics expertise with his love of fishing. This easy-to-use portable flying boat is called the Gyrocopter and is designed with the everyday angler in mind. A small tractor engine provides power, which propels the Gyrocopter along, unbelievably allowing it to reach a top speed of 60 miles an hour. Flying the lightweight aluminum contraption proves to be a breeze. Unfortunately, the gyrocopter doesn't catch on because the loud engine and splashy landing scare away any potential catch. Believe it or not. It's the beauty shot of base jumping. Leaping off a thousand foot cliff with a majestic roaring waterfall as your backdrop. But for an unfortunate jumper, one waterfall acted like a vacuum and it sucked him into a death spiral. Watch. Deep in the heart of South Africa, nestled among some of the world's most beautiful cliffs, rages a 300 foot waterfall that base jumpers simply can't resist. But little did Jeb Corliss realize that a run-of-the-mill base jump in paradise was about to turn into a desperate fight for life. Because as he jumped, this ominous 30-story waterfall sucked Jeb and his chute into its clutches and sent him crashing down to earth. Jeb Corliss knew at an early age that he was a risk taker, always in search of the ultimate thrill. By age 23, he was living his dream, traveling around the world, jumping off any cliff, building, antenna, or bridge he could find. <laughs> Jeb's adventurous spirit soon landed him in the heart of the South African wilderness with this man, friend and fellow adventurer, John Van Shailquick, a local base jumping legend who discovered an irresistible jump site known as Howick Falls. The place is just amazing. It's this uh, uh, really beautiful. Beautiful, but treacherous. The dangers would be on the left hand side, you've got the waterfall about 20 meters away from you. So if your parachute opens just uh, about uh, 20 degrees off to the left hand side, you fly into the waterfall and uh, the waterfall falls onto rocks. So it's a miracle if you would survive a fall like that. John had pulled off the tricky jump several times before, so this time he decided that instead of joining Jeb, he'd videotape his friend's first jump. Setting up his gear on the cliffs across from the falls, John had an eerie premonition. When he looked across the canyon, John noticed something was terribly wrong. And I could see the winds were really, really turbulent. And uh, I yelled to them, you know, don't jump, and I was waving my hands, but they couldn't hear because the thundering of the water was, was quite hectic. With the camera rolling, Jeb, oblivious to John's warnings, positions himself to jump. Three, two, one. See you guys. Jeb jumps. First, his parachute deploys normally. Oh, no. But in an instant, the turbulent air sucks him into the pounding waterfall, slamming him violently into the rocks below. Looking through the lens, John can't believe what's just happened. I couldn't see down there, so I brought the camera back on and I zoomed it in. But he was nowhere to be found. He, just, he was just under the water the whole time. And I thought, OK, what am I going to do? He's dead. And I, I moved the camera over the water and I saw it's, uh, you know, just his body coming up, just floating in the water. John drops the camera and rushes to the bottom of the falls. He finds Jeb clinging to life. Now, the first thing I realize is that I'm very, very cold and I'm starting, to, I'm starting to shiver. And the shivering is really hurting me because everything's broken. But unbelievably, while waiting for his friends to reach him, Jeb's broken body is being attacked. When I'm sitting there holding onto this big boulder, unable to move, I have these little crabs nibbling on me. So I'm basically being eaten alive by crabs. After pulling him out of the water, John stays with Jeb while others go for help. But after such a treacherous fall, 
How would Jeb possibly get out of the wilderness alive? Finally, nine hours later, help arrives. Having clung to life, Jeb's rushed to the nearest hospital where doctors work to piece together his broken body. It takes a month of critical care, but astonishingly, Jeb survives. Ouch. Watching the horrifying videotape, he recalls every excruciating detail of the fall that still haunts him. And as I hit it, I can actually feel my back break. I mean, I just like <laughs> I fall forward. As I fall forward, I impact again. And as I hit the second time, it hits me in the front, separating all of my ribs. Unbelievably, within a few months, Jeb was actually back packing his parachute and tempting fate at Venezuela's Angel Falls, the world's largest waterfall. At 3,200 feet, a dangerous drop over 10 times taller than the one that almost killed him. He's in position. Will he have the nerve? Three, two, one. Without hesitation, Jeb jumps. It's a breathtaking freefall that takes Jeb dangerously close to the mountain face. With all he's been through, why does he do it? I really like the idea of pushing the parameters of what's humanly possible and doing things that others think, that's just insane. There is an unbelievable painter on the streets of New York City. Speed is his trademark. A picture like this, or like this, in 29 seconds flat. Of course, that includes framing. At age 69, you'd think Morris Katz might be ready to slow down a little. But believe it or not, Morris Katz is quicker than ever. In fact, he's the fastest painter alive. I can paint faster than anybody in the world. I can paint much faster than you can buy the painting, OK? And to prove it, here on the promenade at New York's Battery Park, he'll finish two paintings in the time it takes to tell his story. I'm going to paint the park with the street light in the background, uh, the pilotings with the harbor in the background. With the timer ticking, Morris begins. Go. And the challenge is on. Morris has been painting for over half a century, creating mind-bending amounts of art. In my lifetime, I painted and sold more than 260,000 original oil paintings all over the world. More than 1,000 museums have my paintings. Morris's technique is not only fast, it's finely detailed. In only 10 minutes, he can capture all the intricate beauty of the Statue of Liberty. Now, nearly 50 seconds in, let's see how the accelerated artist is coming along on his Ripley's challenge. Already, the images are taking shape. OK, I'm going to go in now to the detail, to the fine detail of creativity. Never mind horse One again. Minute. Here at Public School 88, Morris shows his revolutionary painting technique to a group of third graders. I use a palette knife, you call it a spatula, and uh, oil paints. And I use toilet paper to enhance it instead of a brush, to create like brush strokes. As you can see, his students are quick to pick up his unique style. Good, good, very good, good. I think he's terrific in everything he does. He's uh, somebody to be proud of, to be a New Yorker. And back on the promenade, where Morris has become a celebrity of sorts, the incredible artist adds a final touch. OK, finish. Unbelievably, he finishes two paintings in record time, after a mere two minutes and 55 seconds. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I didn't think he'd be able to do it. There's no disputing. Morris's quick draw technique makes for a show you won't soon forget. I can paint faster than anybody in the world. Ripley's, Ripley's, believe it or not. We'll be right back. Next, these people are praying to a human head. Find out why they swear by the secret power of these skulls. 
Plus, how long can Mr. Freeze stay trapped inside a meat locker? Also, the people on a bare bottom mission to moon this passenger train. And glittering glue on gardens, sure to make you sparkle. Coming up on Ripley's. Getting buried in some parts of Bolivia doesn't mean your body will stay in a cemetery. Believe it or not, people here are digging up the dead because they believe there's secret power in human skulls. This man is a Bolivian witch doctor who uses skulls to heal the sick. But not just any bones will do. The deceased must be buried for at least three years, and the more educated in life, the better. This woman has kept the skull of a local elder in her home for a decade. She and her mother believe praying to it keeps her family safe. And for all the protection skulls provide, they are held in the highest respect, often decorated or honored with gifts. Believe it or not. A new sport has been born in the city of Paris, France. Well, sport may not be the best way to describe what these athletic Frenchmen do. They call themselves yamakaze, and what they do is a cross between ballet and building jumping. Now, don't be fooled. These guys make it look very easy, but they have years of training under their belts. They leap rooftops, scale walls, and jump fences. No, they're not running from anything. These city kids have invented a radical pastime, half sport, half urban ballet. And it all happens in these inner city surroundings. All on their own, they've developed the kind of moves most pro stuntmen wouldn't even try. And now these daredevils are even starring in their own movie. We are the first in the world to do what we are doing now. We create this movement. Nobody did it before. And today, for the first time on American television, Ripley's documents their one-of-a-kind crosstown trip. The bold Yamakasis got their start back in 1997 with seven original members. Athletes who combined acrobatics, gymnastics, and follow the leader to create a unique new sport that's both artistic and risky. Yamakasi quoi, l'art du, du déplacement. La ville, c'est là qu'on s'amuse et c'est super. C'est le plus grand parc à jeux du monde que j'ai jamais vu de ma vie. It's taken years of training for the Yamakasi to develop the skills needed for these maneuvers. And while what they do is legal in France, it should never, under any circumstances, be attempted by amateurs. We are not crazy, not at all, because, because we trained a lot. We really trained a lot. Yamakasi members get together several times a month to engage in their high-speed pastime. They begin by mapping out a route through the city before tackling each new urban obstacle course. The object? To conquer as many outrageous barriers as possible. Yamakasi will be trying to see what he can to do here. You understand? He will not stay just... No. <laughs> he, will have, he will try to see, okay, in this city, what can I do? Today's training run begins at this downtown apartment complex with a quick stretching and warm-up routine through concrete stairwells and walkways. You can be a really nice bodybuilder with big muscles, but it isn't with muscles you will jump, it's with your mind. Your mind, your mind, your mind, your mind. Along the way, even an ordinary stairwell is transformed by the yamakasi. Like a choreographed dance, walls are scaled, fences are clear, and some of the obstacles the Yamakasi tackle on their adventures are so dangerous, we can't show them on Ripley.
But as their action-packed film demonstrates, recognition for this extreme new sport has made its way into modern culture. Seven city kids who can now be found performing around the world. Yamakasi, we know each other since we are kids. We grew up together and um, we believed in what we did and we continue to do it. We never give up. It wasn't always easy, but we never give up. Ripley's world of unbelievable...